Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the idea of a national sales tax or a consumption tax has a lot to go for it. One, it would make us more competitive globally as we sent products around the world because under the provisions of the World Trade Organization, you can reimburse that to an exporter. We can't reimburse our taxes right now. It also would level the playing field in the country, making sure everybody's paying some part of their fair share. But the way the fair tax has been structured, it has a real problem. And that is it lowers the burden on the very highest income folks and the very lowest income folks and raises on middle income people. And the people that have been hurt most by the Obama economy are the middle class. And so my plan is to take the middle class individuals and dramatically reduce their taxes by the following measure. And that is for middle income Americans, no tax on interest, dividends, or capital gains. Let people save their money as the way they think that is best for them, for their kids, for their future, for their retirement. We're taxing too much, we're spending too much, and middle income Americans need a break, and I'll give it to them. All right, uh, we have another question from Portsmouth, Virginia. Go ahead. My name is Linda Gunn. I'm from Portsmouth, Virginia. I'm part of the Virginia T-Payers uh, Taxpayers Alliance. My question has to do with executive orders. Under what circumstances should a president sign an executive order? And how frequently should such an order be signed? Uh, Congressman Paul. The uh, executive orders have been grossly abused by all administrations for a lot of years. But you can't, but some, of, some executive orders are legal. When the president executes proper function of the presidency, like moving troops and other things, yes, it's done with an executive order. But the executive order should never be used to legislate. That is what is so bad. So uh, the executive order should be taken under control. And I has, I've made a promise if as president, I would never use the executive order to legislate. Governor Perry, uh, as, as you well know, you signed an executive order requiring little girls, 11 and 12 year old girls, to get a vaccine to deal with a sexually transmitted disease uh, that could lead to cervical cancer. Was that a mistake? Uh, it, it was, in, indeed. I, uh, I, if I had it to do over again, I would have done it uh, differently. I would have gone to the legislature, worked with them. But what was driving me was obviously um, making a difference about young people's lives. Cervical cancer is a horrible way to die. And I happen to think that what we were trying to do was to clearly send the message that we're going to give moms and dads the opportunity to make that decision with parental uh, opt-out. Parental rights are very important in the state of Texas. We do it on a long list of, uh, of vaccines that, that are made. But on that particular issue, I will tell you that I made a mistake by not going to the legislature first. Let me address uh, uh, Ron Paul just a minute by saying I will use an executive order to get rid of as much of Obamacare as I can on day one. Congresswoman Bachman, do you have a problem with anything that Governor Perry just said? You're a mom. I'm a mom, and I'm a mom of three children. And to have innocent little 12-year-old girls be forced to have a government injection through an executive order is just flat out wrong. That should never be done. That's a violation of a liberty interest. That's ex little girls who have a negative reaction to this potentially dangerous drug don't get a mulligan. They don't get a do-over. The parents don't get a do-over. That's why I fought so hard in Washington, D.C. against President Obama and Obamacare. President Obama, in a stunning, shocking level of power now, just recently told all private insurance companies, you must offer the morning after abortion pill because I said so, and it must be free of charge. That same level coming through executive orders and through government dictates is wrong. Wrong. And that's why, again, we have to have someone who's absolutely committed to the repeal of Obamacare, and I am. I won't rest uh, until it's repealed. Let me let Governor Perry respond. Uh, uh, was what you signed into law, that vaccine for 11- and 12-year-old girls, was that, as some of your critics have suggested, a mandate? No, sir, it wasn't. It was very clear. It had an opt-out. And at the end of the day, this was about trying to stop a cancer and giving the parental option to opt out of that. And at the end of the day, you, you may criticize me about the way that I went about it, but at the end of the day, 
I am always going to err on the side of life. And that's what this was really all about. For Senator Santorum, hey, can, I, go can ahead. I add to that, Wolf? Uh, go, can I add I, to I, that? Hold on a second. Respond. First Congresswoman Bachman, then Senator Santorum. I just wanted to add that we cannot forget that in the midst of this executive order, there was a big drug company that made millions of dollars because of this mandate. We can't, we can't deny well, what that. What are you suggesting? What I'm saying is that it's wrong for a drug company because the, the governor's former chief of staff was the chief lobbyist for this drug company. The drug company gave thousands of dollars in political donations to the governor, and this is just flat out wrong. Right. The, the question is, is it about life or was it about millions of dollars and potentially wow. billions for a drug company? All right, I'll, I'll let Senator Santorum hold off for a second. You gotta respond to that. Yes, sir. Um, the company was Merck. And it was a $5,000 contribution that I had received from them. I raised about $30 million. And if you're saying that I can be bought for $5,000, I'm offended. Well, I'm, a, I'm offended for all the little girls and the parents that didn't have a choice. That's what I'm offended for. Yeah, I, I think we need to hear what Governor Perry is saying. He's saying that his policy was right. He believes that what he did was right. He thinks he went about it the wrong way. I believe your policy is wrong. Yeah. Why, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, why do we inoculate people with vaccines at public schools? Because we're afraid of those diseases being communicable between people at school. And therefore, to protect the rest of the people at school, we have vaccinations to protect those children. Unless Texas has a very progressive way of communicating diseases in their school by, by, by way of their curriculum, then there is no government purpose served for having little girls inoculated at the force and, and compulsion of the government. This is big government run amok. It is bad policy, and it should not have been done. I'm going to move on, uh, Governor Perry, unless you want to say anything else. Look, I, I think we've made uh, decisions in Texas. We put a $3 billion effort in to find the cure for cancer. There are a lot of different cancers out there. Uh, Texas, I think, day in and day out, is a place that protects life. I have passed parental notification pieces of legislation. I've been the most pro-life governor in the state of Texas. And what we were all about was trying to save young people's lives in Texas. Then right. give, then give pe parents the opt-in as opposed to give, teach them, let them opt in, but do not force them to have this inoculation. All right, let's take a question from the audience. Uh, uh, give us your name, please. Taylor, I'm from Orange Park, Florida with the People's Tea Party. My question is, health insurance is expensive because health care is expensive. What is your plan to reduce the cost of health care so that our insurance premiums and other related costs can also be reduced? All right, Mr. Kane. First, repeal Obamacare in its entirety. Amen. Secondly, pass market-driven patient-centered reforms, such as under the current code, the deductibility of health insurance premiums, regardless of who pays for it. But as you know, I want to throw that out and put in my 999 plan. Secondly, the other thing that we can do in order to help bring down the cost is pass loser pay laws. Doctors will tell you that one of their biggest expenses is li medical liability insurance because of frivolous lawsuits. Secondly, restructure Medicare, another big cost that's passed on to us as consumers related to all the bureaucracy associated with that. Another market-driven idea, allow association health plans. When I ran the National Restaurant Association, which today has 14 million employees, we wanted to design a system for health insurance that was going to be customized for our industry. We could not do that. We need to be allowed to do that, and so should other organizations and other associations. Thank you, Mr. King. Governor Romney, a lot of the Tea Party uh, supporters here and around the country have a real serious problem with the health care mandate that you got through in, in Massachusetts. Is there anything you want to say to them to revise or amend? Do you stand by what you did? 
Absolutely. And let me let me come back and just mention something that Her Herman Cain is right. And let's come back to this getting the cost of health care down. I happen to think that's an enormous issue. And, and, and I agree with almost everything you said, Herman. But the reason health care is so expensive, I think you hit the nail on the head. You said it's not just because of insurance, it's because of the cost of providing care. And one reason for that is the person who receives care in America generally doesn't care how much it costs. Because once they've paid their deductible, it's free. And the provider, the more they do, the more they get paid. We have something that's not working like a market. It's working like a government utility. And so what we have to do is make sure that individuals have a concern and care about how much something costs. And for that to happen, health savings accounts. Give people a stake in what the cost of insurance is going to be, what the cost of care is going to be. Co-insurance, where people pay a share of the, of the bill, that makes a difference. And with regards to Massachusetts care, I'm not running for governor. I'm running for president. And if I'm president, on day one, I'll direct the Secretary of Health and Human Services to grant a waiver from Obamacare to all 50 states. It's a problem. It's bad law. It's unconstitutional. I'll get rid of it. All right. Uh, Governor Perry, uh, you're, you're a firm believer in states' rights. Can a state like Massachusetts go ahead and pass health care reform, including mandates? Is that a good idea, if Massachusetts wants to do it? Well, that's what Governor Romney wanted to do, so that, that's fine. But the, the fact of the matter is, um, that was the plan that President Obama has set himself was the model for Obamacare. And I, I think any of us who um, know that that piece of legislation will draw a line between the doctor-patient relationship that will cost untold billions of dollars uh, is not right for this country. And frankly, I don't think it was right for Massachusetts when uh, you look at what it's costing the people of Massachusetts today. But at the end of the day, that was their call. So uh, from a just purely states get to decide what they want to do, I agree with that. And uh, in the state of Texas, we don't think that's the way we want to go. All right, well, you want, I, I'm going to let you respond, but I want to, uh, uh, well, Governor Romney to respond first. First, I'd be careful about trusting what President Obama says, all right, as to what the source was of his plan, number one. But number two, if you think what we did in Massachusetts and what President Obama did are the same, boy, take a closer look. Because number one, he raised taxes $500 billion and helped slow down the U.S. economy by doing it. We didn't raise taxes. He cut Medicare by $500 billion. This, the Democrat president, the liberal, so to speak, cut Medicare, not Republicans, the Democrat. We dealt with the people in our state that were uninsured, some 9%. His bill deals with 100% of the people. He puts in place a panel that ultimately is going to tell people what kind of care they can have. We didn't do anything like that. What the president did was simply wrong. It is the wrong course for America. It is not what we did in Massachusetts. The people of Massachusetts favor our plan to buy three to one. And states can make their own choices. All right. I'm happy to stand up for what we did. But I'll tell you one thing. What he did is wrong for America, and I'll stop it. Thank you, uh, Governor. Uh, I, I, before I get to Michelle Bachman, I want to just, you're a physician, Ron Paul, so you're a doctor. You know something about this subject. Let me ask you this hypothetical question. A healthy 30-year-old young man has a good job, makes a good living, but decides, you know what? I'm not going to spend $200 or $300 a month to, for health insurance because I'm healthy. I don't need it. But, you know, something terrible happens. Uh, he, all of a sudden, he needs it. Who's going to pay for if he goes into a coma, well, for example? In a, in a who, society, who pays for that? In a society that you accept welfareism and socialism, he expects the government to take care well, of it. what do them. you want? But what he should do is whatever he wants to do and assume responsibility for himself. My advice to him would have a major medical policy, but not before. But he doesn't have that. He doesn't have it, and, he's, and he, needs, he needs intensive care for six months. Who pays? That's what freedom is all about, taking your own risk. This whole idea that you have to prepare and take care of everybody. But, Congressman, are you saying the society should just let him die? Yeah. No. Yeah. I practiced medicine um, before we had Medicaid in the early 1960s when I got out of medical school. I practiced at Sa Santa Rosa Hospital in San Antonio, and the churches took care of them. We never turned anybody away from the hospital, and we've given up on this whole concept that we might take care of ourselves, it was some responsibility for ourselves, our neighbors, our friends, our churches would do it. This whole idea, that's the reason the cost is so high. 
The cost is so high, we cause a dumping on the government, becomes a bureaucracy, it becomes special interest, it kowtows to the insurance companies and the drug companies. And then on top of that, you have the inflation. The inflation devalues the dollar. We have lack of competition. There's no competition in medicine. Everybody's protected by, by licensing. We 